Welcome everyone for joining us this morning or afternoon, depending on where you are. Uh, I'm Bill Manning, director with Informed Prostate Cancer Support Group. Um, normally, Aaron would be hosting our meeting this morning, but he had other family commitments that uh, required his uh, presence. So I'm dutifully sitting in for him. Uh, if you attended our meetings uh, at the Sanford Burnham Institute, you will recognize me as the guy behind the video camera recording all of those meetings for all those years. So <clears throat> once in a while, I got out from behind it, and here I am this morning uh, welcoming you to our meeting on transperineal biopsies. Um, as far as when we may get back to the Sanford Burnham Auditorium. I don't know when that, that's going to be. Uh, we've been in constant contact with them. And so far we haven't gotten any word on when that might happen. So until then, um, Aaron, myself and John Tassie will continue giving these live stream meetings through um, good old Zoom. I'd like to also mention today that um, if you weren't aware of it, September is uh, Prostate Cancer Aware Awareness Month. And there's uh, many different ways that uh, you can support that. Um, and I will put into the chat box later um, the email for Bill Lewis, our president, um, as to how you can contribute by supplying copy to local newspapers, local um, uh, media outlets to encourage them to uh, spread the word about uh, prostate cancer. And these are our principles. Bill Lewis, our president, he does a newsletter summary every month. Gene Van Fleet, director and treasurer. Steve Pendergrass, he's our secretary and excellent newsletter editor, myself, uh, videographer, Aaron Lamb, director and meeting facilitator, and John Tassie, our master webmaster, and you, of course. And we're always looking for volunteers. So if you can help us out in any of the, these areas, please get in contact with us through the website. And there's the <coughs> website address. Every month we have a newsletter that's jam-packed with great information. Uh, of course, our monthly video streaming meeting every th third Saturday of each month, except for December. And our hotline number is there on the screen. If you or someone you know that needs some assistance, uh, please feel free to give us a call. Uh, we need people to help recruit and schedule our speakers. So if you have suggestions in that area, we, we welcome them. Um, we also welcome you to share your experience, um, good and bad, of your prostate cancer journey. Um, we share patient-focused experience, and our drive for all these years has been to help you become your own case manager. Your doctor is overwhelmed with patients. They have uh, very little time to look into your case when you come in to see them ahead of time. So it's up to you to keep track of everything that you do and to be able to ask intelligent questions when you go to see, um, to see your, your medical professional. And in that realm, we are not medical professionals and any sharing by any one of our group is not a substitute for your own personal medical counsel. We need your support. It takes money to keep us running. Uh, we have uh, a 501c3 nonprofit organization corporation. Your donations are tax deductible. We are not affiliated with any medical or religious affiliations. Um, as I mentioned, we will keep streaming our meetings until we're able to do this in person again. Uh, you're welcome to make a donation online via PayPal 
or you can send a check to the address that's on the screen now, and that address is also on our website. So next month, we will have Dr. Rana McKay, medical oncologist from UCSD, spoken to us before and was a very, very interesting talk. So we would love to have you show up for that. And with that, I'm going to introduce our guest speaker this morning, Dr. Richard Zabo. He's a urologist in Irvine, California. He received his medical degree from Stanford University School of Medicine and has been practicing for more than 20 years. He is a clinical associate professor in the Department of Urology at UC and Irvine and is on staff at Kaiser Permanente in Orange County and Riverside. He's written extensively about the new transperineal approach and has a special interest in teaching freehand transperineal prostate biopsy under local anesthesia to his colleagues and informing the general public of the techniques advantages over the transrectal approach, which all of us are painfully aware of and lots of great experience. And so with that, I would like to turn the meeting over to Dr. Zabo. Hello, everybody. Um, I, I uh, am going to speak to you today about uh, transperineal uh, versus the transrectal approach to prostate biopsy. I have a disclosure that uh, recently I've become a paid consultant to Corbin Clinical Systems for training urologists to use the precision point transperineal access system. Uh, so this is uh, an illustration of the difference between transperineal biopsy, I'm abbreviating it as TP-BX, uh, and transrectal biopsy, I'm abbreviating it as TR-BX. Um, so the transperineal is different than the transrectal. This is how most of you have had your biopsy through the rectum, through the rectal wall. And uh, the prostate is just adjacent to the rectal wall. So it's uh, quite easy access. Um, and, um, uh, but as you can see, there are other things in the rectum, namely feces uh, that uh, kind of complicate matters when one is doing transrectal biopsy. The other problem is the posterior side, the back side of the prostate is adjacent to the rectum, but the anterior side is far away uh, from that needle. You can get there. You might hit this urethra, um, uh, but you can get there. But I'll show later why the trajectory of the needle is important in um, the yield of the clinically significant prostate cancer. This is the transperineal uh, approach. Here's the skin. One can, easily, um, uh, one can easily sterilize the skin using iodine or chlorhexidine and put the needle directly into the prostate. So you don't have to worry about the bacteria uh, that you have to worry about with the transrectal needle. You know, when before using antibiotics, when transrectal biopsies were started, people would get septic. They would get very sick with bacteria in their bloodstream up to 40% of the time. Antibiotics, uh, um, very good antibiotics that were developed in the 1980s helped advance the use of this transrectal approach. Transperineal actually preceded transrectal. Uh, but then transrectal uh, approach became more popular because uh, one could stave off the infections and also an ultrasound probe uh, was invented that uh, could look at the prostate. So you wouldn't just feel the prostate by putting a finger in the rectum, you would uh, be able to see the prostate. So um, again, going back to the transperineal needle, as you can see, you can get to the posterior prostate, the anterior prostate, you can avoid this urethra. It's not kind of in the way as much. Um, here's what the two biopsies look like in real life from the urologist point of view. This is the transperineal. You see a probe here in the rectum. 
and the um, this is a needle holder. This one is called the Precision Point uh, needle holder. There are other needle holders on the market, but uh, this needle holder acts to keep the biopsy needle exactly parallel to the ultrasound so that the needle can be seen on the ultrasound picture at all times. Uh, this is uh, an example of a transrectal biopsy. Again, the probe is in the rectum looking at the prostate, just like over here, but the prostate biopsy needle goes right through the uh, probe and right uh, through the rectal wall to get to the prostate. So the two important differences between these biopsy approaches are the incidence of infection and the detection of clinically significant cancer. I'm gonna repeat it, the incidence of infection and detection of clinically significant cancer. Um, it's important to understand that infection can lead to sepsis. And this is, sepsis is a serious condition and it results from harmful microorganisms in the blood or other tissues and the body's response to their presence and uh, sometimes the body's response is so strong that you can get malfunctioning of other organs. You go into shock and death is a, a real possibility. And there are deaths, a uh, number of deaths every year uh, uh, from prostate, transrectal prostate biopsies. So going, getting more uh, detailed into what the complications can be. You can have kidney failure and get put on dialysis temporarily or even permanently. <clears throat> you have tissue death, uh, the fingers or toes, and that might require amputation. That looks like this. Why do you get this? It's because the blood pressure goes down so low, the medications to keep you alive in the hospital shunt the blood away from the fingers and the toes and the feet and the legs and people wind up with amputations when they get very, very sick from sepsis. Um, you can get permanent lung damage from acute respiratory distress syndrome, kind of like long COVID, but for forever. Uh, permanent brain damage, uh, memory problems or symptoms or disability. I know of a patient who had a brain abscess from sepsis from a transrectal biopsy, and he no longer can walk, talk, and uh, his uh, wife changes his uh, diapers 10 times a day. Uh, and uh, uh, that's from a simple transrectal biopsy. You can have later problems with your immune system, uh, raise the risk of future infections or damage to the heart valves called endocarditis. And that can lead to early heart failure and therefore early death. So um, as I'm, I, I just like to emphasize that it, it it's pretty apparent that transrectal biopsy is not very safe. It can be made pretty safe, uh, but I'll get into <clears throat> what sacrifices need to be made in order to achieve that safety. Um, so the, the, the thing that's happened, I'll tell you personally, the reason I started to get into the idea of transperineal approach is I put my the, the head of my hospital, a medical director in the hospital after a transrectal biopsy, then my department administrator and patients. Uh, and this happened starting about 12 years ago. Um, and I thought, there's really something wrong here. Why is this happening? It didn't happen before. And then uh, I had a patient uh, while I was thinking, you know, I got to do something about this. While I was thinking about this, a patient became uh, so sick that uh, he got uh, uh, disabled uh, from severe sepsis and it changed his life uh, to, dramatically. Um, and, uh, um, and then I looked into alternatives and found that the transperineal biopsy was being used because of this very problem where there was a rising incidence of these infectious complications after transrectal biopsy. And that's because there was increasing microbial resistance uh, over the years. Um, it's become so bad that uh, uh, in the recent American Urological Association um, white paper on this 2018, uh, 
the review showed that urine and prostate infections after transrectal biopsy, uh, this is with antibiotics, uh, was about five to 7% in incidence. And sepsis uh, seemed to be about one to 3%. That's that sepsis I talked to you about that could result in a minority of cases in great disease and, and great disability. Um, uh, the death rate is difficult to demonstrate, but in certain populations where there's a good registry, uh, like in Sweden, they, were, they found that the death rate was 0.12%, and in here in Taiwan, by Wyatt al., uh, they found the death rate to be 0.13%. That's one in 800, uh, roughly. Uh, so uh, let's go into that. Uh, um, just the death rate from severe sepsis, uh, from all causes, not just prostate biopsy, is about 20% on average. Um, it can be 40%. It depends on the study. This is a study from New Zealand uh, where they have very good uh, tracking of uh, medical outcomes. And I just went over the death rate after transrectal biopsy. Again, hard to uh, demonstrate. But I want to emphasize that this is a 1 in 800 chance of dying, uh, not from surgery to cure you, uh, not from um, um, uh, uh, drug treatments to cure you. This is... Uh, a uh, one in 800 chance of dying from a semi-elective screening test for a slow growing cancer that may not show you any, uh, that may not show cancer. A famous study that is often cited is uh, Loeb and colleagues uh, from 2011. And um, in their analysis um, uh, of a, a large number of men from a special database that underwent biopsy spanning almost 20 years, they uh, showed that people who were hospitalized with an infectious complication after transrectal biopsy had a 12-fold greater 30-day mortality rate compared with those not hospitalized. Now, one of the reasons it's difficult to demonstrate the death rate from transrectal biopsy is uh, on the death certificate, which is the way we are able to research these things, often they may not put that you died from a transrectal biopsy. They'll say you died from what's called a septic embolism or a brain abscess or a heart inflammation. Uh, but what really caused it was in, in, in uh, what, why is it that they have a 12 fold greater 30 more day mortality rate is they developed a severe sepsis and succumbed to their sepsis. Uh, uh, but this is hard to demonstrate, as I said. Um, so I ask this question, not just of patients, but of doctors. When faced with the chance of developing sepsis after a biopsy of your prostate, what would you do? Uh, would you uh, uh, take the example of flying on a jet from LAX to JFK, and, you, and you're given the information that one of 178 passengers on that jet is going to have sepsis upon arrival in New York. That's that, that chance is about 0.56%. That is not one to 3%. Obviously it could be one out of 30 if it was at that 3%. I'm using the figure that we have at Kaiser Permanente with very good uh, antibiotic um, uh, treatment uh, before, uh, as prophylaxis before the biopsy, close monitoring of patients um, and it's 0.56. That's one out of 178 uh, or would you uh, do a stopover, one, one hour layover in Denver? And uh, so obviously this is a, a flight that takes a little bit longer, but when you get to JFK, your chance of getting septic is zero. Which flight would you take? So um, again, transrectal biopsy is not very safe because the infection rate is increasing and because of that, the sepsis rate is increasing. And um, the, I, I wrote this in my review of transperineal biopsy procedures that the increasing difficulty of preventing the serious post-transrectal biopsy infectious complications stemming from an inherently transfecal procedure, that is uh, the term that's being used in Europe in describing the transrectal biopsy, which is kind of, which is very much falling out of favor, 
that has spurred many centers to abandon appropriate antibiotic stewardship as they add antibiotics of last resort, such as ertapenem, to the prophylactic regimen. Now, this is what I was hinting at before. You can make the transrectal biopsy much safer. In a review article, um, uh, uh, well, a retrospective review that I did of 15,000 um, prostate, transrectal prostate biopsy case that performed over three years at Kaiser Permanente. We found that people who used augmented prophylaxis, uh, meaning not just the regular one pill of Cipro or one pill of Septra or one pill of Cephalosporin, but very strong antibiotics like ertapenem or amikacin, these are antibiotics that we use to treat the infections that are resistant to everything else. These are our last ditch antibiotics. We found that uh, the infection rate was much lower, one out of about one out of 300. You will have reports in literature that people have done 1,500 of these biopsies uh, using erdipenem and not had a case of sepsis, but I did not find that uh, in my real life study. And um, uh, it's, it's just not 100% because uh, for, of reasons we don't really know. Why is it that a very, very strong antibiotic doesn't always prevent sepsis? Um, it may be that when you put the needle through feces, it's just too much of a bacterial load for the antibiotic to handle. Um, but uh, we don't really know why it doesn't always work. But more importantly, here we are using not to treat infection, but to prevent infection, a, a last ditch antibiotic that we really need. We need these antibiotics to treat people who come in with the very resistant infections, who come in with um, uh, sepsis and nothing works except ertapenem. Well, the more you use an antibiotic, the more uh, uh, the development of resistance, uh, the increase uh, in resistance. And eventually, just like the way penicillin went, eventually, uh, uh, you will have large resistance. So ciprofloxacin, for instance, was used for many, many years uh, to prevent the uh, sepsis from uh, transrectal biopsy. However, uh, now the uh, resistance rate of, uh, to ciprofloxacin is almost 40%. That's a very strong antibiotic. It's actually because of the side effects of ciprofloxacin may be worse than the benefits Actually, in certain countries in Europe, ciprofloxacin is banned. So um, again, transrectal biopsy is not very safe. There's another uh, side effect of transrectal biopsy, and that is rectal bleeding. Well, uh, you know, people have hemorrhoid vessels and people have uh, arteries there in the rectum, and we can occasionally hit those vessels and they bleed. Um, the uh, bleeding happens often. Uh, but in two and a half percent or one in 40 people need intervention. They have to go into the emergency room to either be observed or sometimes the bleeding doesn't stop. So we put in a balloon to put pressure on the biopsy, or I've even seen people go into surgery uh, to suture a bleeding vessel. So uh, that is uh, also uh, a a problem with transrectal approach. Actually, you don't get that with transperineal because you're not putting any needles through the rectum. Um, so that's the infectious problem. Then transrectal biopsy is also uh, relatively inaccurate. Now, uh, the standard transrectal biopsy historically has a high false negative rate. It misses about one third of the clinically significant or higher grade prostate cancers. And we've been used to, over the years, when we do these radical prostatectomies on patients, uh, we find between 22 and 43% uh, of the patients have upgrading, uh, and not just maybe Gleason 3.3 or what we call grade group one now, they have grade group two or grade group three, and we missed it on transrectal biopsy. Well, when that was the only thing we used, we thought, well, that's just the way that we do business, and that's just the risk we take. Um, but uh, obviously, if a patient has a very high grade cancer on one side and the doctor saved the nerve on that side, uh, 
uh, that might be the reason that the patient is not cured because that cancer tends to go out where the nerve comes in. And had that doctor known, had that surgeon known that there was a high grade cancer on that side, he might not have saved the nerve and the patient would have been cured. So this is quite important. The fact that tr the standard transrectal biopsy, not with fusion, but the standard systematic transrectal biopsy is relatively inaccurate. Um, however, uh, fusion, which we call MRI, magnetic resonance uh, and slash ultrasound fusion, where we uh, superimpose the uh, ultrasound picture over the MRI targets that we find, uh, that fusion targeted transrectal biopsy, I'm talking about transrectal now, does improve accuracy. Uh, it increases the detection of clinically significant prostate cancer by almost 50%. This is level one evidence by the famous precision study group uh, that uh, established MRI as pretty much a standard of care in uh, Europe. Uh, it's uh, not yet standard of care here. There's a little bit of controversy, um, but um, um, uh, it's, it's in, in the United Kingdom, for instance, uh, patients will not have a transrectal biopsy before they have an MRI to see what there is to target. Uh, and that way, if you have a negative MRI, um, no biopsy is done and the patient is observed. Um, so I, I don't mean to digress, but um, there is a 20% false negative to these MRIs and sometimes they're missing some cancer, uh, but usually they catch it in time. Uh, is, 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 and that's the rationale for doing MRIs and, and uh, avoiding um, uh, biopsies on patients who have negative MRIs. Um, so getting back to that, um, if you use a fuse target, um, use transrectal biopsy, you can increase um, uh, detection of significant prostate cancer by almost 50%. Our problem, you know, lately especially, is it's come to be understood that we should not be treating small volume, low grade prostate cancer. There are even studies or papers arguing whether or not we should call these low volume, low grade prostate cancers cancer uh, because almost everybody who gets 80% um, of those types of patients are uh, not treated. They're given active surveillance or sometimes focal therapy, but I'm not gonna get into that right now. Uh, just, it's very important to understand that we don't want to find these low-grade cancers because all they do is just cause a lot of extra work. We want to find the patients who have the clinically significant uh, cancers so that we can treat them because those are the ones who are in danger. Uh, this is uh, what MRI fusion-guided prostate biopsy machines look like. The, uh, there is a detector. This is the Euronav, for instance, and it detects where the um, uh, probe is relative to the prostate and you can move the probe a little bit and it kind of uh, detects it and transposes it to show where the ultrasound, uh, where, where the probe is in the ultrasound so you know where your needle is going. And there's a, as I said, a, an ultrasound picture superimposed on an MRI picture and it keeps everything in place so that when you uh, aim, at a targeted area with the ultrasound, you get it. Uh, this is a different platform called Coelis, just a different machine, <clears throat> works in a little bit in a different way, but they do the fusion. So this is the prostate biopsy, and then there's a target, and the target we make into a circle because we want to hit that area. First is uh, usually is done a systematic biopsy where we just biopsy roughly 12 uh, cores, in a usual fashion, and then the, the targeting is done. Actually, I usually do the targeting first uh, because I want to get to the meat of the matter uh, just in case um, uh, we have to stop the biopsy for any reason, which I've not had to do. Um, <clears throat> so um, <clears throat> transrectal biopsy, another problem with transrectal biopsy is it's costly. Now, uh, you m might think when you've heard about transperineal biopsy that, oh, well, transperineal biopsy is, is more costly because you have to have different equipment and uh, different needle holders. But the truth of, of it, the matter is that for the system, transrectal biopsy is more costly. Why? 
because it's estimated uh, that there are over 39,000 cases of post transrectal biopsy sepsis per year. When you uh, multiply these cases of sepsis, which are almost always admitted um, to the hospital, the estimated cost of hospitalization to the United States is between 341 and 752 million dollars a year. Uh, that increases the cost per biopsy uh, to over $300 per biopsy uh, of extra cost to pay for those hospitalizations. Medicare is paying for that. Insurance companies are paying for that. Who is paying for Medicare and who's paying for insurance companies? You. So um, uh, your insurance costs are up because of uh, these complications from transrectal biopsy. I'm not even talking about the rectal bleeding. <clears throat> There's also a problem. Inaccuracy uh, requires repeat biopsies. You get a negative biopsy or a low-grade tumor, but that PSA keeps going up, so you have to have another biopsy. Um, and what happens is if you're inaccurate, maybe you would have been, uh, say we had found the cancer on the first biopsy, well, you would have been treated, say, with radiation or radical prostatectomy. But if we missed it and we said, oh, let's watch it, and two or three years later, we finally find it because um, uh, on transrectal biopsy, on repeated biopsy, we finally find it, usually because it keeps on growing, we may have lost the window of cure. That's costly. Uh, now, all of a sudden, we're having to pay for uh, hormonal therapy. We're having to pay for chemotherapy. We're having to pay for uh, salvage radiation, salvage treatments. Uh, instead of just one and done and your cure. So it's costly. Um, so let's compare transperineal biopsy approach to the transrectal approach. I will show you in the coming slides that it's much safer, not just a little safer, which is trying, uh, that's an argument of people who are trying to hold on to the transrectal biopsy approach. It's much safer. And I'll show you that uh, transper transperineal, bi excuse me, transperineal biopsy is more accurate than transrectal biopsy when coupled with fusion targeting. And uh, it's less costly to the patient and society because of these uh, 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 factors. Uh, so why is transperineal biopsy safe? Well, I, I showed you the theoretical. It, it doesn't go through the rectum. And uh, I did a review that was published this April and found uh, over 7,000 cases um, of local anesthesia, what we call freehand transperineal biopsy, where uh, we don't use a mounted grid on, uh, uh, on the perineum that has a lot of holes, kind of like battleship. Uh, we, use, um, just, we just make two holes in the skin <clears throat> and get to the prostate, to all areas of the prostate that way. Uh, anyway, under local anesthesia, uh, uh, over 7,000 cases, there were zero cases of sepsis. And this is compared to the one to three, uh, sorry. This is compared to the one to 3% chance of uh, sepsis quoted by the American Urological Association for transrectal biopsy. Um, uh, when I included patients who had had intravenous or general anesthesia, um, uh, there was an incidence of sepsis, 0.02%, not one or 3%, 0.02%. And it, uh, in my analysis, I found that it was likely associated with urinary retention. That is the patients had been put to sleep with either intravenous drugs or general anesthesia gas. And uh, we know just in, in any case that uh, where people have intravenous sedation or general anesthesia, that there's an incidence in men with big prostates of urinary retention. And likewise, that may be the same here. Um, uh, uh, the, and once you have urinary retention, you, if you have bacteria in your urine, uh, it can get into your bloodstream. Uh, so uh, that's at least what I'm proposing is the mechanism for that, but it's still very, very small, very, very low compared to the incidence of sepsis for transrectal biopsy. If you, um, uh, it's maybe um, 150 times less. Uh, 
uh, for transperineal biopsy. Rectal bleeding, 0% for transperineal biopsy in my review. You just don't find that there's rectal bleeding. Why? Because all you're doing is putting a probe in the rectum like, like a digital rectal exam. It's a little bigger, bigger, a little bit bigger than the finger, but uh, uh, you're not putting needles through those hemorrhoidal vessels or through the arteries running through the rectal wall. Whereas, as I mentioned before, there's a two and a half percent uh, um, incidence of intervention for rectal bleeding uh, um, when uh, people go to the uh, where people have to go to the emergency room. Um, so this is, I, I don't mean for you to have to look at much of this slide. I'm just listing these studies to uh, tell you that initially transperineal biopsy and transrectal biopsy uh, in the early 2000s, when they were compared, they were shown to have equivalent um, accuracy in detecting prostate cancer. That's with systematic prostate biopsy, uh, where they weren't targeting targets found on MRI. However, when transperineal biopsy is coupled with um, the MRI fusion, comparisons show that it's actually 50 to 60% more accurate than transrectal biopsy. This will, uh, uh, why, wh wh what is the evidence for this? Um, uh, there is, I'm gonna start with uh, the early evidence, uh, um, this and Hossack, um, this guy, this, um, um, actually did uh, took a prostate um, uh, that had been removed and uh, did uh, transperineal trajectory needles on it as well as transrectal and found that they were able to better detect the biopsies. Uh, they were better, better detect the cancer that was found in the anterior prostate, the front of the prostate, the part of the prostate away from the rectum. Um, these two and Pepe did uh, what we call meta-analyses and they felt uh, that uh, the evidence showed that there was a 50 to 60% more accurate um, detection of, biops of uh, prostate cancer uh, with the transperineal method over transrectal. But I want to circle here these two papers that came out 2019, 2021. They're level one evidence. What is level one evidence? That's the best evidence we have uh, to show uh, uh, that something works. Uh, and it's because it's randomized controlled. Uh, it's not kind of retrospective review that is very, um, very much uh, subject to bias. Uh, so uh, Bear took uh, 77 patients and um, uh, they did both they put them to sleep and both did both transperineal and transrectal biopsy on these patients. And um, uh, they randomized in which order the patient would get uh, their biopsies. Some got the transrectal biopsy first, some got the transperineal biopsy first. And they showed about 50% uh, increase in detection of clinically significant cancer in the same patient. Uh, Rabat um, just simply randomized who got a transperineal biopsy and who got a transrectal biopsy, and they found a similar increase uh, in the detection of clinically significant uh, prostate cancer. So uh, that those two uh, studies are level one evidence, not just retrospective reviews. And I have to say, uh, I'm surprised that the Bear study, the 2019 study, was not included in um, in a, a couple of. Uh, uh, what we call meta-analyses that were written after 2019. Um, uh, those um, uh, meta-analyses written after 2019 showing that transperineal biopsy was superior to transrectal biopsy um, when using MRI ultrasound. Those, those papers uh, did talk about equivalent or slightly better detection with transperineal biopsy, but had they uh, used Bear or Rabat, uh, Bear especially, because that was done before uh, the, uh, the meta-analyses were performed, uh, they would have been more strong in their recommendations towards transperineal biopsy. So uh, why is it that we have better detection of prostate cancer with transperineal biopsy? This is um, transrectal on the top, transperineal on the bottom. 
the area of interest for cancer is this thing called the peripheral zone, PZ, peripheral zone. Prostate cancer is not usually seen in the transitional zone. Well, when you do a transrectal biopsy, the needle comes in at this angle. This is the trajectory. You're getting part peripheral zone and a little bit of transitional zone. Uh, this is the transverse view. Now looking from the side and cutting, um, imagine you're slicing this apple from the side. This is what it looks like. And again, you're getting a good, a good amount of peripheral zone, but you're getting some transitional zone. This is diluting your ability to find cancer because you're wasting part of the core has transitional zone in it. And that's, and what we want is pure peripheral zone on our uh, needle and to get uh, a full two centimeters of peripheral zone. Well, transperineal solves this. The biopsies don't come up, they, they go longitudinally through that cylinder. And it's like this, they have almost pure peripheral zone when um, uh, you use a transperineal angle. And also please note that here you're coming from below, it's hard to get up here. It hurts to do that actually, it's hard to anesthetize this area transrectally. But from the transperineal aspect, it's very easy, you just hit it, boom, it's right there. And, and you're getting just pure peripheral zone. So that is the, um, uh, the reason that the anterior prostate is better sampled and the peripheral zone is better sampled everywhere because you're getting just pure peripheral zone, no dilution with transitional zone. Um, so I mentioned the meta-analyses that missed that level one evidence. Uh, recently, Winokur was, um, uh, a meta-analysis quoted in a debate at the American Neurological Association. They still felt uh, that transperineal was better, but they did not include the evidence of bear. They felt it was a little bit better. Look, 59 versus 54 percent uh, uh, transperineal versus transrectal in terms of their uh, uh, detection of clinically significant cancer. They felt that it wasn't that 59 to 54 was not statistically different, but have, had they included bear, it would have been pushed way higher than 59, maybe in the 70%. Um, so uh, the other problem with this Winokur, um, I'm sorry, the, the other problem with, uh, um, well, with, um, the, there's another, excuse me, there's another meta-analysis by Ray, and uh, they felt that there was very low certainty of the evidence, but still transperineal was better for several reasons that I've already mentioned, but they also missed Bear and Rabat. Um, there is a randomized trial, uh, another one, and this time with many more patients, not just 70 or 200, but uh, over a thousand patients, and that's uh, going to be coming out sometime in 2025. Well, again, uh, I want to stress that increased accuracy equals increased chance for cure. And the delay in diagnosis of this clinically significant cancer means a delay in adequate treatment. If you have a delay in adequate treatment, you have active surveillance that is inappropriate. You have focal therapy that's being done and they're missing uh, maybe the uh, uh, higher grade cancer that they should be treating with focal therapy. Or maybe you have really bad cancer and you should have multimodal therapy, surgery plus radiation or medication. Uh, increased accuracy increases your chance for cure. Um, uh, all, many of you are on active surveillance and this is uh, for you to look at. Um, when you have your active surveillance biopsy, um, should you have transrectal or transperineal? Here is a, 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 a study published uh, early in, uh, uh, in April of 2021, where uh, Meyer et al. compared uh, their uh, active surveillance of uh, using transperineal biopsy and transrectal biopsy. And they found that uh, they upgraded men more often with transperineal, 21%, that's about 50% more uh, than they upgraded with uh, transrectal biopsy. So these people were upgraded and they probably went on to treatment because they were found to have worse cancer than they thought. Um, and uh, these are some details 
where um, uh, people were upgraded to grade group greater or equal to two and 40%, 44% had grade group greater than equal to two detected in the anterior prostate with a transperineal prostate biopsy, whereas only 18.7% uh, had their cancer greater, uh, or greater or equal to group two detected with a transrectal biopsy. Again, showing you how transperineal more easily accesses the transperineal, the, tra the anterior prostate. Um, and uh, for the even worse prostate cancers, they, the transperineal found double the amount of uh, great group greater than or equal to three. They found 6.1% versus 3.3% for transrectal. Uh, uh, this is strong evidence to show that people on active surveillance should really go for a transperineal biopsy just to, to really know what's going on and not miss things. Um, so what does the lower cure rate mean if you have an inaccurate biopsy result? Uh, I, 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 I don't mean to um, depress people, but if, if you have complications and non-cure, uh, it's, it's not, uh, you, this thing can be a chronic long suffering with urinary bleeding, painful urination, loss of interest in sex and impotence with the hormone treatments. Uh, nausea and other effects of chronic medications, bone pain, depression, and loss of years of life. Um, there are misconceptions still being published when it comes to uh, transperineal biopsy. And these misconceptions are used in arguing why uh, urologists will stick to their transrectal biopsy approach. Transperineal biopsy, when first restarted in the uh, 2000s, was associated with what's called transperineal mapping, where they took a biopsy every five millimeters and people would get up to 50 biopsies of the prostate. This was to find cancer they couldn't find with transrectal. It worked pretty well, but it required general anesthesia. 50 biopsies is a lot, and they didn't know uh, how to do local at that time. Um, uh, so there's that perceived need for general anesthesia. It's thought that uh, therefore you have increased cost because of general anesthesia. Also, there's that grid I was talking about, the stepper unit in a grid. These are, uh, this is expensive equipment that you fix to the bottom of the bed and uh, through which you uh, place the transperineal biopsies. Well, we don't use this anymore. We're doing freehand, uh, the freehand procedure. And uh, we've done away with general anesthesia. It's done mostly under local. Uh, we've done away with stepper unit and grid. It's uh, shown to be equivalent in uh, several studies. Uh, is the procedure time much longer? Uh, that's an argument used for uh, avoiding the transperineal approach. Is it more painful? That's an argument, again, used for that. Well, let me, uh, let me uh, break those misconceptions. I say, get with it. Look at the recent literature. My literature re found, my literature review found that um, we could uh, over seven thousand cases of these freehand transperineal biopsies under local anesthesia, no sedation, and um, it can be therefore easily integrated into a normal urology office workflow using only local anesthesia. You don't have to go to the operating room or the surgery center. Um, is there increased cost? Well, to whom? And this is something, uh, this is where I empathize with my uh, colleagues who are in private practice who are paying for the equipment. Um, so again, there's no need for general anesthesia, the grid or step, stepper technique, um, uh, the increased cost, the real increased cost are to the system between 173 and $382. Uh, tacked on for every transrectal biopsy performed just because of sepsis. Uh, and these costs are charged to you via Medicare and insurance companies. Australia figured this out, as has the UK. And Australia, uh, which is a semi pay for performance or pay, uh, uh, private pay uh, system, has increased the remuneration for transperineal biopsy by 20%, and they decreased it for transrectal biopsy by 50% to encourage urologists to use transperineal biopsy. And in the United Kingdom, over 70% of the biopsies are transperineal. The, the National Health Service there understands they're paying through the nose for transrectal biopsy complications and they wanna save money. Um, uh, so 
I'll get back to the other costs to private practice urologists in the United States. Um, uh, so um, let's get with it. Procedure times. I've been uh, told uh, that, uh, oh, I'm not going to do transperineal biopsy. It takes an hour. Well, um, if you uh, look at the literature, the average time for transperineal biopsy under local anesthesia with the freehand technique is 19 minutes. For transrectal biopsy, it's about almost 15 minutes. So comparable. Yeah, a little bit longer for transperineal biopsy. But let's remember that with transrectal biopsy, um, uh, usually fewer cores are taken. With transperineal biopsy, you can take extra cores in the anterior prostate. You actually get more samples and it takes longer to get more samples. It truthfully also takes longer to anesthetize because it takes uh, more an, um, uh, xylocaine and anesthetic to anesthetize and a little bit more skill. So that also takes a little bit more time. Uh, pain scores, you'll hear urologists who are holding on to transrectal biopsy. Oh, that transperineal biopsy, are you kidding me? That's painful. We got to put people to sleep. Well, with the uh, looking at my literature review, I found almost 4,000 transperineal cases that reported pain scores. And the pain rating averaged about 3.17 out of 10. And uh, looking um, at the average pain scores um, uh, over 10 studies, uh, this was summarized by Tiang in 2007, the pain rating there was 2.6. Not much of a difference uh, between 2.6 and 3.17. Um, so uh, there's even uh, maybe some uh, improved ways of anesthetizing to decrease the pain rating and uh, Wang et al. decreased uh, their pain ratings from 3.3 to 1.8 by injecting the branches of the perineal nerve. Um, uh, also quoted often is, oh, they're, they're having urinary retention like crazy when you do transperineal. Well, that is true if you do transperineal biopsy with uh, um, that mapping technique. They were quoting old data uh, with the mapping technique, when you do 50 biopsies, your prostate swells up, and if people are asleep, you have two reasons for them to go into urinary retention. But the average rate of urinary retention with uh, local anesthesia of uh, uh, freehand technique is 3%. Um, and uh, uh, if you limit the analysis to those transperineal cases where fewer than 16 cores were taken, making it more like transrectal biopsy, the average rate of urinary retention fell to 1.4%. And that's comparable to what's quoted as an average rate of urinary retention for transrectal biopsy, 0.2 to 2.6%. So what should we do? And uh, this Jeremy Grummet, who is an early advocate for transperineal biopsy, I'll just read his quote. He says, to provide truly patient-centered care, the biopsy technique using the safest method with the highest detection rate of significant cancer should be used. MRI targeted transperineal biopsy is an excellent option and should be performed wherever available and feasible. So I'd like to summarize by saying that uh, um, uh, I, re I reviewed over 12,000 cases of freehand, uh, up to 12,000 cases of freehand transperineal biopsy in the literature and found that transperineal biopsy is superior in safety through the virtual elimination of post-biopsy sepsis and rectal bleeding, inaccuracy with higher detection rates of clinically significant cancer using MRI fusion targeting, and costs because the adoption would save the United States up to $752 million per year. Transperineal biopsy is also comparable to transrectal biopsy in pain score and procedure time. And I wanna now just quickly address uh, it does cost more for the private urologist to purchase the, uh, an extra probe for the transperineal biopsy. You need a, a, what we call a side fire probe, not an end fire probe that sees the needle as it enters the perineum better. Um, and it does cost more uh, to uh, have these special needle holders. There are um, uh, urologists who advocate not using the special needle holders. I think it's well worth the extra couple of hundred dollars per biopsy for the, the needle holders because it really um, keeps that needle in line with the uh, picture on the ultrasound. But uh, it is hard to make a buck if you're a urologist and you're 
basically in private practice, if you're paying for this, uh, the, the extra um, equipment um, because of the way Medicare remunerates for it in the United States. And so I would advocate for uh, us to go the way of Australia, uh, where you get better remuneration for the transperineal biopsy, less for the transrectal, encourage urologists to do this, and, uh, and it would be a win-win for the patient, for the urologist, and for the health system. And with that, I conclude my talk. Well, thank you, Dr. Zabo. That is truly a remarkable amount of uh, information. Uh, we've got so far one question in the, um, in the box here. Where can I get a transperineal biopsy? And is there a list of US facilities? Uh, yeah. In, in, um... In a number of major universities, they have already switched over to transperineal. Johns Hop in the East Coast, Johns Hopkins, University of Connecticut, um, uh, Fox Chase uh, in, in Philadelphia. Um, and uh, on the West Coast, uh, not uh, there isn't a general practice to switch over to transperineal, although at UCSA, if they know how to do it, uh, Dr. Abreu, at USC knows how to do it, and he uh, does a lot of transperineal. Um, Dr. Uchio at UCI uh, knows how to do this. Uh, he does mostly transrectal, but he knows how to do it. Um, uh, at Kaiser Permanente, I am, I've taught a number of uh, individuals, but at present, I'm the uh, only one who does it within Kaiser Permanente. Um, there are some uh, individuals who've been trained. Um, there's a Dr. Song. David Song in, um, uh, in uh, Diamond, uh, uh, in Abrea, I believe, in, in Orange, uh, in, in the Southern California. And there are um, some people in San Diego who've just been trained, um, and, uh, as well as at UCLA. Are they, have they adopted it? Uh, do they have much experience? Uh, that I can't speak to. Um, um, I was myself thinking of doing this in private practice, but as I said, uh, I'd ha um, as I told you before, I'd have to give up Medicare in order to be able to charge enough to, uh, so that I wouldn't be losing money on every biopsy. And um, uh, I like working at Kaiser Permanente, doing a lot of different things. Uh, and if I gave up Medicare, I personally would have to uh, um, and, uh, stop my work at Kaiser Permanente. So, um, <clears throat> there is a list uh, on the perineologic um, website, uh, which is the uh, uh, company that um, uh, manufactures this precision point uh, that is illustrated here, uh, that special needle holder. Uh, I'm on that list, but uh, as I said before, I'm limited to Kaiser Permanente. Um, but there are several other doctors around the country. Um, uh, so major universities on the East Coast and maybe uh, uh, UCLA, maybe USC uh, down here and San Diego, I, I think they were recently trained at the university. I can't remember exactly where, but I know they were just trained a couple of weeks ago. But again, that's low numbers of cases. They're kind of new at it. Um, the, the way to help us uh, get to universal adoption, like in the United Kingdom or in Australia, is for you to demand it. Um, just say, I'm not gonna have a transrectal biopsy. I don't care how safe it's gonna be with uh, erdipenem. I don't want you using those very strong antibiotics on me. Uh, and I want a higher detection rate. You'll get um, doctors say, oh, <clears throat> they'll say to you, I never have an infection. Well, um, Maybe they haven't seen one in three or four years, but eventually it's going to happen no matter how strong the antibiotic they use. And they're not being good stewards of our antibiotic uh, medications because they're kind of uh, accelerating uh, us uh, to resistance to those antibiotic medications. Um, uh, but uh, as uh, Howard Walensky said, he's a reporter who's taken this on, <clears throat> vote with your feet and vote with your prostate. 
Very good, very good. Um, you spoke about the issue regarding um, the added cost for the equipment. Um, what about actually um, learning the process itself? You know, what, what is the learning curve and do you detect a reluctance amongst other urologists to do <clears> this? <throat> yeah, thanks for bringing that up. Uh, that is one of the reasons um, uh, academics in urology um, state is a, there's a difficult, uh, there's some difficulty in adopting transperineal. Uh, they claim that the learning curve is steep. Um, uh, I don't agree with that. Um, uh, maybe after 10 biopsies and you can do it with an experienced person, it can be proctored. Uh, I, th I think you'll have enough uh, knack at getting the biopsies. It's not that difficult. It's not a mysterious, um, uh, a mysterious technique. Um, and, uh, but, but there is a bit of a learning curve. And when you're in a busy practice, just stop and change your practice, invest in a different probe. Probe would cost 10 to $15,000, uh, $200 for this, uh, precision point needle holder, um, per case. It's just, um, it kind of is a barrier. Uh, and then a bit of a learning curve in the middle of your of your training. If you learn right off the bat, as many residents do, how to do the transperineal biopsy, you know, you learned it at first. So there is no change in your workflow. Um, I forgot to um, mention that we have guidelines uh, published by the urological associations. And in the European Association of Urology guideline, transperineal biopsy is listed as the recommended first line biopsy uh, that should be done if feasible. Uh, whereas uh, that's not yet the case in the American Urological Association guidelines. They still talk about the stepper and the grid and the general anesthesia as if there's no freehand local anesthesia and they are delayed in getting new guidelines out since in the last three years and there's been a ton of literature put out and a, a lot of adoption of the transperineal throughout the country, um, but um, I, they're, they're loath to push it on, on the urologists who are uh, having difficulty uh, 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 with burnout as it is and with, uh, with decreasing remuneration in their practices. And, um, you know, they, they're, they're not just an academic organization, they're a political organization advocating for urologists. So I think that's one of the reasons it's not taken up very strongly by the American Urological Association. There's a different form of payment here in the United States. It's not Canada, it's not uh, England, it's not Australia. Well, that's, uh, that's for sure. Um, I remember in a recent Zoom meeting, Dr. Rick Polbert from uh, the UK was pointing out how in his practice he had actually trained uh, nurses in his office to be able to do this procedure, which would seem to give you um, the added advantage of being able to, um, the, for the urologists themselves to step back and be able to uh, concentrate on other um, modalities and leave this as more of a routine. Does that um, factor in here at all? Um, I, uh, I, I certainly would support that. Uh, if you teach someone who day in and day out does nothing but transperineal biopsies, they're gonna become very good very quickly. You don't really have to have four years of med school, six years of residency, and who knows what extra experience to do transperineal biopsy. It's just a technique, you know, um, and you're just hitting the targets. So it's just a technique. It's like shooting uh, a rifle. I, I don't like to bring up guns, but you know, it's like that. Um, uh, it's just a technique and you can get better at it uh, just as long as you have a certain modicum of intelligence and, uh, and coordination. So I guess then the takeaway here is, is that uh, patients should start um, requesting this uh, 
from their urologist. And of course, their urologist will say they can't do it. Um, but the more voices that speak up, um, then the urologist can then uh, speak up to the insurance companies, and then hopefully a transition could occur. Yeah, well, um, the people who are advocating for this, like me and Dr. Popert and, and uh, several people in the United States, um, uh, are trying to work with the American Urological Association. Um, uh, they're meeting with insurance companies, um, but uh, really it's going to take people demanding it. I know that's happening at Kaiser Permanente. Uh, used to be, I would hear maybe every three months, I would hear from uh, somebody who'd say, you know, this guy's demanding a transparent eel. You're the only guy who can do it. Could you send him down from Bakersfield, blah, blah, blah. Um, now it's every month and it's going to accelerate. And once it becomes uh, so popular or the, the demand is so heavy within our system uh, that uh, I won't even have time to do it, uh, then we'll, we'll find ways to have other urologists uh, perform uh, this biopsy. There is a Kaiser Permanente you think would be just like the National Health, but it isn't. They actually do um, pay uh, urologists for the number of patients they see to a certain extent. It's qualitative more than quantitative, but qualitative is very powerful. So there is um, a little bit of uh, 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 reluctance uh, for people to take this on because it takes longer and you have to learn uh, um, and uh, everybody's very busy. Right. Well, I'll give one more chance for anyone to add a question into our Q&A box. Um, but it looks like they've been all, all answered. Um, we thank you very much, Dr. Zabo, for your time. You've been very generous in sharing all this information. Uh, this video is being recorded and will be up on YouTube, um, in probably a couple of weeks. And if anybody has any further questions, you're welcome to go to the IPCSG website and forward an email to us and we'll do our best to answer your questions. Oh, what looks like we have one more. Nope, we don't. Just an excellent presentation comment, which, okay. I, which I concur with. So with that, I think we'll go ahead and uh, end our meeting. Uh, hope everybody can join us at our October 16th meeting and uh, have a great rest of the day. And again, thank you very much for your uh, time, Dr. Zabo. My pleasure.